Good morning, everybody. It's, morning, ain't, morning. ain't it cozy in here when it's raining? And, uh, you know, it just seems a lot a little co cozier to me to be here in church with y'all. Well, it's good to be here to welcome everybody. Uh, uh, what do I want to say? Um, yeah, uh, I, want, I want you to take it. Watch your mouth this week. We don't want you to lose no more teeth and all that stuff. So be careful. Um, me, me and my wife, we do. We do that kind of thing every night. She ain't not going to pick it out yet. But, but, you know, at the end of the day, she knows who I'm going to go home and snuggle with. My dog. So, uh, I have a... Uh, he's my go, brother. What's that? He's my be go now, brother. Now it's fixing to go. I'm going to lose some teeth. All right. Um, verse for the day I have for us. Um, I just want y'all to repeat after me. The Lord our God... Lord our God will be with us, be with us. Wherever, we go. wherever we go. That's Joshua, first chapter 9. Verse first nine. Chapter nine. Right. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless our tithes this morning. Holy Father, we, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather and sing to you and praise praise, praise you, Lord. Just uh, thank you for loving us. We, we thank you for, for Jesus. He bought us with his blood, Lord. We we thank you so much for him. We, we thank for Brother Robert. You just used him this morning to show us the way home and the light. And, oh, just want to lift our ties up to you this morning as a symbol of our love, our obligation to you, Lord. We, we uh, want to lift our music ministry up, Lord. They, they do a wonderful job. We just thank you for them. And, uh, we thank you again for Jesus for what he did on the cross for us, Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Salvation, he rose and conquered the 
Father, we have been in your presence all week. We are never not in your presence. We're gathered here now together with your people. And we have opened your word already this morning. And hopefully have it open before us, have our hearts open to it. Father God, not only that, we have the Spirit of God living within us. Your Spirit whom Jesus, your Son, said comes to lead us into all truth. And He's the Spirit of God who lives within us. He's also the living Word. Jesus, your Son, it's his very presence who is within us this morning. And I pray that we would hear you. May we hear you. We are here for your sake to worship. We're here for our soul's sake to feed us, to make us aware of what we may not be aware of. So I ask you to speak. Silence this world. This world that does not want to give us a moment of rest. This world who is constantly vying for our attention with news. Help us to put that aside and put our full focus upon you these next few moments. Speak in your name, I pray. For those of you who will turn in later, I encourage you to stop the tape right now or stop the recording and go straight to Daniel 5 and read it. We've already read that this morning. and I thought it was important to read Daniel 5 in its entirety. Whenever I read scripture, often, even though it's a passage I'm familiar with, I, often I'm like, wow, look at that. Would you just look at that? Whoa, and, and this, this scripture, I'm, there's a surprise in here. There's something in here I find hard to believe, and I'm not talking about the hand coming down and writing on the plaster of the wall. I'm talking about what didn't happen between verse 28 and verse 29. After the hand had come down and wrote on the plaster of the wall there in the palace, after Belshazzar went to great effort to find a competent, adequate preacher, someone who can interpret these words after he turns his kingdom upside down, ask every wise man, supposedly, and diviner, and astrologer, can you interpret what this means? And then Daniel is brought out of retirement. This is not the first time something similar has happened already in Daniel's life. It's a great book. Read it. 
12 chapters. You can knock that out this afternoon. Daniel is brought out of retirement. He correctly interprets the handwriting on the wall. We still use that today, that phrase, the handwriting on the wall, to indicate there's an impending message of doom here. There's something we need to pay attention to. Daniel looks at what is written on the wall in the plaster of the palace. I have a feeling God wrote it much slower than I just did. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Perez, or Parson, as it may be in some translations. Daniel looked at those words, said, Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Now, in case you missed it, old Belshazzar, God said it twice. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. King James reads, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. That's a, that's a pointed message. You, you, King Belshazzar. It's not your brother or your sister, but it's you, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You, O oh King, standing in the need of prayer. Perez, your kingdom is divided, is given to the Medes and the Persians. That message was faithfully interpreted, faithfully delivered. It remains written on the wall there for everyone to see. So there's no mistaking its meaning now. There's no way the king could reach a false conclusion about the sermon. It's as plain as day. It's blunt to the point. Here comes the moment that always usually comes between the word of God and the benediction, you know? We hear God's word, and then there's a moment there to do what with it? Respond. Oh, surely Belshazzar will come to his senses after hearing this and hit his face and go, oh God, please forgive me. But he didn't do that. Nebuchadnezzar, his father did when he heard God's word. King David, when he was confronted finally with his sin, a year after he committed his sin, oh, then he hit his face and asked God's forgiveness. But verse 29, it just skips right over any kind of invitation and acceptance. It says, when it, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. After, Daniel said, don't bother with all that stuff. I'm not here for the bling. <laughs> I'm not here for the paycheck. He ignored the message. It went unheeded. At this point, it seems to have done nothing but interrupt his buzz. He was drunk. He was in full glory as a king would be, an earthly king would be. Started out the cocktail party. The wine was flowing. You know, everybody was having a good time. My wives are here. That's plural, by the way. My concubines are here. That's plural, by the way. It was a party. And they were all having a good time. And he had the bright idea. Let's go. Those, mm -hmm. Yeah, down in the museum. That, that, that my father, Nebuchadnezzar, captured out of Jerusalem. And it's been set aside all this time. Those golden goblets that were there, set apart, consecrated to be used in the worship of God. Bing! I'm going to go get those. Those will go great with my wine. And we'll pass it around. And it'll be a good time. And he did that. And then suddenly, a hand, writing, deep impressions on the plaster, 
Plaster is crumbling. I think the room was shaking. King's knees definitely were. That's what it says. A couple of times it says all the blood drained out of his face. Suddenly got very sober. What? But then, okay, that's the message you've got? Hmm. No, I don't think you're talking about me. <laughs> nah, that doesn't apply to me, but I tell you what, I'm going to clothe you, and we're going to rock on. I think you went right back to the party, and that very night, what God wrote on the wall happened. And I read that, and I go, huh. Oh, the word was sought out. People came to church, so to speak. What has God got to say? And then the word was unheeded. You know, last week we looked at the lost word, how Josiah, how the word of God was found in the temple and had been ignored for 75 years. You're like, how did that happen? Well, I think it all happened beginning right here when the word back then just went unheeded. Okay, we've read the God. We've done the God thing. Toss. Where's your Bible been this week, by the way? Yeah, I encouraged you to get in it. Where did it go? Where did that go? I'm just curious. You know, I could give you an account. What is God saying to you this week? That would be some good conversations to have. How is God speaking in your life individually? Because we've all had the opportunity to open God's word, to hear, to give him those moments, to give him that time. And I read this account and I go, whoa, it went unheeded. And then it's like, okay, why does that really surprise you? Because doesn't it go unheeded today? I read some things that churches do, that pastors do. I even occasionally click on it occasionally. Occasionally, I've used that twice. I even go to YouTube every now and then when I hear about something, I just see it for myself and I'm going, what were they thinking? What were, you, what were you thinking? Pastor, what were you thinking? <laughs> and I'm, talk, I'm after the pastors, you know, because the ministers, the Bible says in James 3, those who preach God's word, teach God's word, will be held more accountable. Daniel did his part. And the king just, eh. We do that with God today. They did it in Jesus' day. The living word was walking among them. And what did they do? They tolerated him for a while. They benefited from his miracles. But in the end, they treated him as they did every other messenger of God. We don't like what you're preaching. So we're going to nail your message shut. God in the flesh. The word of God made flesh became the unheeded word of God. And on and on and on it goes. Why? Why does this happen? There are three reasons given in the account. The first one is this. Ignorance. Ignorance. Now, we use that word. It's become a derogatory adjective. Not meant to be. And I hope we don't use it in that fashion. Ignorance means that somebody has been ignoring something important. Some folks... We can say, well, they're just ignorant. Hmm. They had opportunity. They chose to ignore it. I mean, when God's people, it can be said of us, oh, you're just ignorant of God's word. Well, that doesn't sound nice. No, we've just been ignoring God's word. We haven't spent any time in it at all. The hand came down. The word was written right there in front of the king's face. It was written right there next to the lamp in the palace so that it would not be missed. And the king saw it with his own eyes. He watched the hand as it wrote. He sobers up. He calls all his wise guys together. At first, they can't interpret it. Even he becomes more terrified. The queen hears about this goes in and says, hey, there's a guy named Daniel. You need to check him out. He can correctly interpret the message, okay? To his credit, 
King Belshazzar did that. He did not ignore the word of God right away. He wanted to know what it said. Even in the midst of a drunken, drunken stupor. <laughs> Stopped him cold. You may say, yeah, I would stop us cold too, wouldn't it? I mean, if all of a sudden, it could happen again. If all of a sudden a hand, a disembodied hand came down and started writing on our walls. I don't imagine any of us have any lingering effect from the week. <laughs> But all of us would be sober real quick. We can't read this. We don't know what it says. We'd go get some experts, wouldn't we? Some religious experts. And suddenly this place would be on the map. It would become a shrine. There'd be committees formed as what what let's interpret this and let's see let's see what all we can we're going to write books about this and and it would cause quite a stir, as it should. That's why King Belshazzar has one up on us. He did not plead ignorance like part of the congregation in Jesus' parable of the sheep and goats. You remember that story there in Matthew? When Jesus gave these words, when they were confronted, that they had, they had ignored him in his time of need. Remember? Sheep and the goats. God's going to separate the sheep from the goats. What did they all say? Lord, when? 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 Tell us. The sheep and the goats both do this. You know, when did we see you naked and clothe you? That's what the sheep would say. The goats would say, when did we see you naked and not clothe you? Lord, when did you we ignore you and give you nothing to eat? And Jesus responded, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Oh, we, we missed that. We missed that. On the day of judgment, as we stand before God and give an account, and he's the only one who knows all of us. He knows our histories. He knows our stories. He knows every opportunity he's given us. He's no, he knows every one we've missed. We're not going to be able to stand before him and go, Oh, God, I didn't know that was in there. Really? I didn't know you meant me when you said, be your witnesses. I missed that. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. I don't think that answer is going to work. I mean, again, how many Bibles do you have at your house? How many Bibles do I have? I mean, it's all around. We, we have access to this. We have access in the Spirit of God living within us, the living Word of God within us. So to say, well, I, I didn't get that. If you have spent time around God's Word. Now, if you're a baby Christian, okay. That's why you're in the nursery still. But if you're not a baby Christian, so one of the reasons the Word goes unheeded is due to ignorance. You've just been ignoring the Word of God. It also goes unheeded because of confidence. I think Belshazzar has a lot of that. I mean, I think halfway through the sermon, half, halfway through the interpretation of what's written on the wall, he says, I, 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 this doesn't apply to me at all. That hand doesn't know what it's talking about, as if hands could talk. <laughs> My kingdom has come to an end. I don't think so. I've been weighed on the scales and I come up short. Really? Excuse me, Mr. Hand, but have you seen my kingdom? Tell you what, you go out there, you thumb yourself a ride, and you see how short I am. This city covers 15 square miles. There's a great wall around the whole town. It's an impregnable fortress. Why, the walls are 300 feet high. Some places, they're wide enough for four chariots to race side by side. We, we can hold a NASCAR event on these walls. What do you mean? I'm weighed in the balance and found wanting. And even if the Persian army should lay siege to us, we have enough food in here for the next 20 years. We have an endless water supply on the Euphrates River. Flows through the city from north to south. Thank you for your concern, Mr. Hand. But we don't need you to point out problems that don't exist.
that could be our culture's response in some instances. That's our whole idea of reshaping what truth is. Nowadays, this truth of God's word is just as valid as your truth, whatever it happens to believe, be that you believe out on the streets. Belshazzar was confident in his kingdom. He felt secure behind the walls of his do domain. And this is evident in the fact that he throws a blowout celebration party right in the middle of a war with the Medes and Persians. I mean, what's about to happen that night they're already surrounding his city. Kind of like Eisenhower. We start at D-Day. Hey, let's party. <laughs> Makes about as much sense as what he's doing here. God's word went unheeded because, guess what? The king's trust and confidence were elsewhere. And again, is that not like us? We don't pick up this because I don't need that. I'm feeling good. Things are going great right now. We run to this when things aren't. We rely on the externals to gauge what is going on internally. But the Word of God does something internally, it exposes us. Guard your heart. Jeremiah the prophet said, the heart is deceitful above all things. I came across a sermon this week. I came across a minister, a young minister, and I'm praying for her. She's 29 years of age. I listened to her whole sermon, about 20 minutes, preaching from Psalm 139. You know the passage there where it says, you have formed my inmost parts. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And she said that's often used as a biblical condemnation of a woman's right to choose the best reproductive option for herself, used frequently to manipulate a narrative that omits abortion as a sacred decision. The misinterpretation of the psalm has caused harm and invoked shame, shame on an immeasurable number of women. Those are quotes from her message. And I hurt. I hurt how someone can spend their young life studying theology, getting a theology degree, suddenly gains enough clout in the denomination where this took place. It's not ours, but that doesn't matter. It could just as easily be, okay? I mean, we've Baptists have done stupid things, like inviting a president into your pulpit. And he doesn't represent God. And I read that, and then she talked about how she had an abortion. And her then, at the time, boyfriend, she called him my partner. I didn't realize that's the phrase today. I heard it for the first time in Dallas a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Now, we don't use boyfriend and girlfriend. That puts too much shame on someone. If we're not married to them, we call them partner. And her partner at the time, she was right in the middle of seminary, this young minister, and became pregnant. And they immediately rushed to the cathedral to pray, to call doctor's offices and search for where they could get the best abortion. But she even made the comment, something holy is happening here. And that's how she interpreted the whole event. Hmm. Have you ever read the Word of God and found a verse you really liked and it spoke to what you really wanted and suddenly that became your theme verse? And you started pointing to a promise in Scripture that was never meant for what you want. But 
you're misinterpreting it. But you just believe, oh, God's going to give me this. False confidence. It comes from our goodness and our sweet little relationship with Jesus that he would never, ever put some pressure on us at all. I don't know how well we really know ourselves, especially when we're young, but hey, I know some folks who've grown up older and they, uh, I don't see the wisdom in the years. Back when Vicki Lynn and my wife and I were married back, it's been 40 years ago, there was a study called Master Life, and it was a 26-week study. And then part of the study, very early on, you had the opportunity to do a personal spiritual inventory. And I remember the night doing my personal spiritual inventory and coming and sharing with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we all went around the room and told our score. And my score was one of the highest in the room. And I was like, oh, whoa, kind of surprised me. I heard everybody else's score, though, and realized, oh, much lower. And, and it bothered me for just a little bit because I thought, well, maybe I didn't read it right because I have one of the highest in the room, and I shouldn't have. Five years later, I did the study again. Five years' time, I dropped 10 points. <laughs> About 15 years later, I did the study again to lead the study. I dropped 31 points. Now, I just want to point out, I was still doing everything I probably was doing back in the 1980s, but I just had a different viewpoint on things. I mean, I pray, but come on. Do you pray as much as you should? I don't. Even though I'm praying. Huh. Do you witness as much as you should? Thing is... God sees it all. God knows when he nudges our heart. And so he knows he's the only one qualified to hand us a report card and say, I'm really expecting mine to read something like this. Robert, you were obedient about 5% of the time. But we've all whooped ourselves up into an excitement that, oh, I can't wait to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Go back to what Billy Graham told King, Larry King, in an interview. Larry King said, when you get to heaven, what, what do you expect to hear? And Billy Graham said, well, I hope to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but I'm not sure I'm going to hear that. When I heard Billy Graham say that, I was like, huh? So the word of God went unheeded because of ignorance, because of arrogance, excuse me, confidence, and finally because of arrogance. He was the king, Belshazzar was, and no one was going to tell him what to do, even though the writing is written on the wall. Daniel comes at his invitation. He preaches a sermon based on wall of Babylonian palace, chapter 1, verse 1. Included in that sermon were these words. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. Here we come. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life in all your ways. King, you think you're in charge of your life. You're not. We think we're in charge of our lives. We're not. First Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Paul, writing in the inspiration of the Spirit, says, Do you not know your body is a temple? of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. 
And that day you pray to ask Jesus into your heart, guess what? You no longer belong to yourself. You no longer belong to you. You no longer had the right to decide what you wanted to do and how you were going to do it and this, that, and the other. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, what does it say? Honor God with your body. Honor God with your life. Trust in the sovereignty. Trust in him. Belshazzar heard that message, but he said, no, I'll do what I want. I am in control of my life. I'm the king of my kingdom. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Here's your gold robe, your gold chains, purple robe. Your third command now. Well, he's about to be second in command. Very quick. Went right on back to the party. And history records that while Belshazzar thumbed his nose at God in celebration, Persians and Medes were digging a canal at that very moment to divert the Euphrates River. And while the king slapped the hand of God and said, no, thank you, an occupation army under the leadership of Gabrias was marching under the wall of Babylon in a dry riverbed and headed for the palace. And that very night, Belshazzar was slain. God sent his word, warned him. Daniel preached a sermon, warned him. And the word of God went unheeded. Well, that's how Belshazzar did not pay attention to God. But the big question is, how am I not paying attention to God? Where are you? Not paying attention to God. Let's pray. Father, you're so kind and gentle. I mean, you're just holding back the great celebration, the great homecoming. You're holding that back to give men and women to give those created in your image the opportunity to say yes to you because your word clearly states you do not want any to perish. You do not want anyone to perish. You love everyone. You created them. You're loving and gracious with us. But there comes a point, and we don't know when that is. You do. When you examine a life, a kingdom, a country, a nation, and you're like, you've had so much time and so many prophets and so much opportunity. And you've heard me, and I've convicted you, and then you silenced me and you hardened your heart. And I think it's time. God help us. If anyone is there right now and we do not know it, awaken us for your kingdom. Speak. In your name I pray. Let's bring this in the Lord, put him in.